Lecture 25, Strain from Deformed Markers, Geometrical Methods In this lecture, we will look at some geometrical techniques to determine strain in rocks from deformed markers such as fossils or particles in a rock sample. Fossils often have planes of symmetry or known angular relationships which are constant in individuals of a given species. Brachiopods for example have a hinge line and a median line, which are orthogonal before deformation. We can use a collection of deformed brachiopods to determine the strain ellipse. This method is known as the Wellman method. First, we draw a line A, B of arbitrary orientation and length. Preferably, this line should not be parallel to any fossil line. Then, for each deformed brachiopod, we draw a pair of lines parallel to the hinge and another pair parallel to the median lines. These lines should pass through the points A and B, giving a parallelogram. We do the same for the next brachiopod. And the next one. 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 And the last one. Through all the pairs of fossil points determined in this way, including points A and B, we can sketch a best fit ellipse. This represents the strain ellipse. We can determine the long and short axes of the ellipse, and the ratio of these axes, which is the ellipticity. Now, let's look at determining strain from the distribution of particles in a rock sample. If the rock is composed of an aggregate of particles whose centers are relatively easy to identify, and if the distance between particle to particle centers before deformation was approximately constant, we can use a center to center technique called the Fry method to determine strain. Here is one example the image is a thin section of a Silurian oolitic limestone. We need to determine the strain using the Fry method. The Fry method works as follows. First, the center points of the particles are marked on a transparent overlay, and a central particle one is marked as well. Then, we move that mark to another particle center, let's say two, and mark the center points of the particles again. Here it is important to move the overlay just along the horizontal or the vertical. This procedure is repeated for all the particles, and the result is a central void marking the strain ellipse as shown in figure C. However, this method is rather tedious. Fortunately, there are computer programs that facilitate this. Here is the exercise solved with the program Ellipse Fit by Frederick Vollmer. After marking manually the OID centers for one OID location, the program repeats this process for all OID locations, ending up with a void in the center which indicates the strain ellipse. In the program, it is possible to draw manually an ellipse limiting the void, and from it determine the orientation of the principal axes and ellipticity. If we are dealing with elliptical particles in the undeformed and deformed states, such as the clasts of a conglomerate, we can use the RF over phi method. Notice that for this method to work, the particles in the deformed state must have a significant variation in orientation. This figure shows how the method works. Suppose before deformation, the clasts of a conglomerate had the same initial ellipticity, Ri equal to 2, but different orientations. In a graph of ellipticity, R, versus, the angle of the long axis of the clasts with the horizontal, phi, all clasts plot along the vertical line Ri equal to 2, and the applied strain ratio Rs is 1. In a polar plot, with phi increasing around the circle, and are increasing radially outwards from the center of the circle, the clasts plot on the circle of ellipticity 2, and the strain ratio, Rs, is 1. After an applied strain ratio Rs equal to 1.5, the marker shapes are different and depend on their orientation. The final ellipticity of each marker, Rf, varies, and the markers don't fall anymore on a vertical straight line in the R versus phi diagram or along a circle of constant ellipticity in the polar diagram. Notice that phi still exhibits a large range of orientations. When the applied strain ratio Rs is 3, Rs is located somewhere between the Rf of markers 1 and 7. Notice that for Rs equal to 3, 
there is a much more limited spectrum of phi orientations. This is clear in both, the R versus phi graph, and the polar plot. The applied strain ratio, Rs, and the initial ellipticity, Ri, can be found from the minimum and maximum final ellipticity of the deformed clasts, Rf min and Rf max, respectively. We need to consider two cases, the first one is when Rs is lower than Ri, and phi has a large range of orientations. In this case, the equations for Rs and Ri are these. The second case is when Rs is larger than Ri, and phi has a limited range of orientations. In this case, the equations for Rs and Ri are these. This example is idealized because the undeformed markers have the same initial ellipticity, Ri. However, the method will still work for undeformed markers of different Ri. The Ri computed by the method will be the maximum ellipticity in the undeformed state. Finally, let's look at the process of restoring a strained object to its initial shape and size, using the information from the strain ellipse. The thickness of the deformed layer is 1.3 meters. If S1 is vertical and is 1.25, and S3 is horizontal and is 0.8, what is the original thickness of the bed? First, we locate a point O on the base of the layer. From this point, we trace lines parallel to the principal axes of the strain ellipse, which intersect the top of the layer at a prime 3 and a prime 1. We measure the length of these lines, L'3 and L'1. Then on a separate diagram, from a point O we draw the restored length of the lines along the principal axis, L3 is equal to L'3 divided by S3, and L1 is equal to L'1 divided by S1. The end of these lines defines the top of the layer. The base of the layer passes through the point O and is parallel to the top. The restored thickness of the layer, T, is 1.1 meters. To learn more about this topic, read Chapter 3 of Fossen and do his e-learning module on strain. And answer these questions.